Once again, welcome to our service today in week one of Burned Out. A survey in 2021 by Indeed.com revealed statistics that probably wouldn't shock you. That when surveyed and asked people across many different generations who are in the workforce, if you were to, to answer the question, do you feel burned out? At work, 52% of people said yes. In just two short years, and I know a whole lot transpired in those two short years, that number increased nearly 10%. In fact, a more recent survey, end of 2022, revealed this, that nearly 87% of people in the workforce said at least at some point, Last year, during the year, at work, they were burned out. Now, that word's a buzzword in our world today. It's definitely a word that gets a whole lot of play when it comes to, to work. Which is why it probably resonates with you when you see it on a screen. But you, you might be wondering why a New Year series at church titled that. Like the new year and the start of a year, when we set some goals and have some resolutions, is is usually a time where a little bit more up and a little bit more positive and, and not quite yet so burned out. And yet I would argue with you that perhaps in the midst of a new year, the reason why we chose this theme is not just because we've heard in so many different ways over the course of the last year that that, that feeling was, was one echoed by many of our members, but it far, goes far deeper than work. And perhaps part of the reason is when we start a new year, most of us set some new goals, which usually include some new things, which means we're adding to the plate, and what most of us don't do very well is subtraction. And I think that's really what we want you to think about with this series and why we're placing it where we are in the church year. Because we don't want you to get to July and be burned out. We'd rather be proactive, talk about the issues, and address them so that you and I can be blessed in all of our godly callings. And here's the thing that we uh, talk when we talk about being burned out. It's not a workplace thing. It's a life issue. Like you might feel burned out at work, but it, it might be because you're not physically in a good place. And you might be burned out at work because relationally you're overwhelmed. You might feel burned out at work, but the reality is you're burned out emotionally. And so you couldn't necessarily relate that to just work. It's life. It goes beyond the eight to five that you're, you're, you're doing right now. It's 24 hours, seven days a week. Which is why I really want you to think about the why behind the what of burned out. Like, so for so many people, burned out is a work thing if... And if that's the case, then we should probably examine the numbers and look at it. What's changed throughout the last hundred years? Because living in America right now more than ever, our culture more than ever, being a Christian in America in the light of being burned out is really difficult. <coughs> so what's changed? I mean, is work really the problem? Is it causing burnout? Well, the stats from a hundred years ago would say... Probably not. If you go back to 1920, the, the average American who was working worked six days a week versus five and worked eight hours or nine hours a day versus seven to eight today. Like 48 to 50 hours a week was the work week for a person 100 years ago, and we do about 10 less in our culture today. And there's some of you who are a little bit older, maybe grew up on a farm, heard the stories of your grandparents I'm going to tell you that working from sun up to sun down on the farm six days a week was really hard work and would leave you exhausted. But it didn't seem like burnout was all the rage like it is today. So maybe it's not work. And then to add to it, just think about the reality of 100 years down the road from 1920, we all have cars that get us from point A to point B in 
far quicker time than anyone used to be able to travel, so you have more time at, at your disposal, even though you work less than they did. And just think about all the modern inventions that we have in society today that make our life easier and simpler than 100 years ago. Like that thing that's in your kitchen, kids, called the dishwasher. Like your grandparents back in the day had to scrub and scrape and work. And it took time. Or how about the laundry? Like that machine, you just throw it in and you drop a little gel tab. Like you used to have to scrub on a pan and your fingers, some of you probably did this, and your fingers bled and you had to hang it up to dry. The thing that you push around the house, kids, that vacuum, or no, some of you don't even do that because you have these little things called Roomba that get hook, hooked up to a plug that they bounce around the walls and they suck everything up off the ground. You don't have to spend any time doing it. My guess is, those of you who are maybe 10 or under will never set foot in a grocery store. You'll just put your order online. You'll back your car up or have it delivered. Like You know how much time we have at our disposal because of the advances of modern society? They had less time. We have more from a work standpoint. Yet we're far more burned out. Why? Like if I maybe just touched a chord with you, can I make an ask of you that over the next few weeks you will come back? Because I don't want you to, to journey down the path to burnout. Here's a working definition I want you to see for what we're talking about how we get from point A to point B of burnout. Like no one signs up for it. No one wants it to happen. It usually goes off like a bomb. When it does happen, where did it come from? Well, here's the path. These pastors kind of laid this out. Pastor Mike's using this downtown today. The path to burnout begins first with this. You compromise. You make a choice, usually. And I'm not saying every choice is right or wrong, good or bad, but every choice comes with a consequence. You compromise. Like maybe some of the stats that help us understand burnout is this. 60 years ago, in 1960, only 20% of mothers worked. Like those raising kids, only 20% of mothers worked outside of the home. Moms who are stay-at-home moms work a lot. They work really hard. But 60 years ago, only 20% of, of moms who had kids and younger kids worked outside the home. Today, the number is 70%. I'm not saying right or wrong. We live in a world where people get to make choices, but you know what that means still? That the things that moms did 60 years ago when they stayed at home and worked need to be done later. They don't go away. Maybe that's part of the reason. Or how about this? Maybe the compromise is kids. A Harris poll surveyed 1,000 adults on behalf of TD Ameritrade who had at least one child playing in a club sport, a non-school team, so a team outside of your sports. In that research, here's what they found. The average parent said they spent 12 hours a week on their kids' activities. I'm not saying right or wrong. This is the judgment-free zone. I was a parent who did that. But that's a choice. It's a compromise. Your schedule, that brings consequences. That same survey said that nearly one quarter of those parents got an extra job just to pay the bill. Add to it everything social media brings to the table, our digital-driven age, it's so easy to compromise, whether it's work or relationships, families, kids. And I'm just going to be honest. Like, maybe the church is a little bit of the problem. Like, we ask you guys to give of your time, and we ask you guys to group and do life together. We, we ask you to gather on a regular basis. Like, there's a whole lot of things that are being asked, like, I don't think those things are wrong, but if, if we've given you the impression that without doing it and doing it to the extreme, you're doing something wrong, maybe we've caused you to compromise. Like, this is all the part of the path to burnout that I want you to see and maybe think about in your life. Are you compromising? Are you working more to make more, but your family's paying the bill? 
and real price? Are you compensating to give your kids every last thing possible, but it is killing your relationship with your spouse or killing you physically? Because when you compromise, eventually you'll compensate. Like you'll do something to try and overcome it. You'll try and fill the void with something. Maybe it's gifts. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's booze. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's energy drinks, which by the way, not all are created equal and most of them are not really good to have in abundance. But that's just a different story for a different day. You compensate because you're compromised. Before you know it, you won't see it. You will crash. Path to burnout, compromise, compensate, and crash. And I want you to think about that over the next few weeks as we talk about it. Because we don't want you to end up there. What do we need to address in the meantime? What are we compensating uh, with? What, are we, what, what have we compromised that, that we can address and maybe consider that we need to, to do physically, spiritually, emotionally, and relationally so that we don't burn out, so that we don't go there? So if you're like me, and at some point in 2022, you probably were, you experienced that feeling of being burned out, what can we do with God's help and strength and encouragement to be resilient Christians and thrive in 2023? And we're going to work at, look at four areas of our life, and I'm going to call them the four legs of a stool. And because all of you like props, I'm going to have a prop that I'm going to show you each and every week. But this is a stool, it's got four legs, physical, spiritual, emotional, relational. Four legs of the stool that all go together. Like if one of them is not on solid ground, it will affect the others. Like you might emotionally feel burned out, but it might be due to the fact that you are burning it at both ends physically. Like the issue might be the physical leg of the stool isn't on the ground. Maybe it's the fact that you're not physically in a good place. Like you're, you're just not. You're, we're going to talk about some of it. You're not getting the sleep that you need. You're not active like you should be. And, and it's affecting you emotionally. Or maybe it's relationally. Like, the relational piece is just a mess, but it's affecting you spiritually. Like, you see, all four legs of the stool need to be solid and strong and on the ground. Like, if one of them is broken or short, you know what happens when you sit on the chair? You fall. Like, we need all four on solid ground, all four really strong. So we're going to talk about all four over the course of the next four weeks. And here's the why I want you to come to all four weeks. It's hard to be fruitful. Like we talk about Jesus' roots, Spirit's fruits. Every year, we set goals as a church to help you plant stronger Jesus' roots because we want for you what God wants for you, fruits. Peace and joy in your home. Self-control in the face of temptation like patience and kindness with the people you love the most. Like we want fruit for you, but it is hard to be fruitful if physically, spiritually, emotionally, and re or relationally you are exhausted. Like I'm not talking about a tough week. I mean, powering through Christmas Eve and four services on Christmas Eve is exhausting. Like it happens in your world too. Like there are stretches where the rubber band gets stretched, right? Like it's exhausting, but I know even on those weeks when I get exhausted, you know what doesn't get displayed as much as on days when I'm not? Fruit. Like if you, want, if you want to know if you're on the path to burnout, if maybe you've compromised, if maybe you're compensating, if you're close, ask the people in your home. On a daily basis, do you see fruit? Like am I coming home more days exhausted and, and is my tone harsh or loving? Are my words Meant to build up, or do they tear down? Or ask the people in your life, are you being selfless or selfish? Fruit. Like, I know that I want more in my life in 2023 to be fruitful. And I want it for you, and God wants it for you. But you can't have it if you're exhausted. So resiliency-wise, physical, spiritual, emotional, we're going to talk about one leg of the stool each and every week. Which leads us to today, Physical. And here's the thing about the physical leg of the stool. Like in my opinion, it's one of the four, and here's why we're starting here, that is the most in your control. 
you get to make choices about where you work, how much you work, what you spend, how much you spend, what your calendar looks like, and what your time gets directed toward. You get to make choices about working out, exercising, taking care of yourself, what you put in the cart at the store, what you buy and pay for, what you slug down your gullet. All those things are, your, are choices, right? Like spiritually, you have some choices, but the devil is hard at work. Temptation is beyond your control, right? It's going to happen. Like, but physically speaking, almost everything in this area, and why we're starting here, is because we believe you have, are the one that gets the right to make the choice. And as you consider that today, and as you think about the things you might be, maybe have done to compromise or are compromising, I want you to think about some scriptural principles and we're going to apply them and give you some action items to consider so that you can be physically resilient and get that leg of the stool on solid ground so that you don't compromise in certain areas that will lead to burnout. And there's no better person who understands the importance of physical than our, our Savior Jesus. Like Mark chapter 6, Jesus, true man who came to earth, Jesus who lived 33 years like you and me, Jesus who was tempted in every way like you and me are, who had a schedule, who was busy, who had people coming after him, who had all sorts of things he could do, choose to do, understood the importance of physical resilience. Jesus, in Mark chapter 6, gives us a great example. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported him all that they had done and taught. He just had just sent them out. They had amazing stories of all that they had experienced, like heart, hearts were turned uh, to God. People came to faith. They did miracles. Like, can you imagine the disciples on fire just telling the stories? Jesus, can you believe what we did? Like, Jesus, people like actually took it to heart. Like, Jesus, we, we performed miracles. And then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, not only had they just come back, were they on fire, they weren't going to shut it down. People were crowding around them, wanting more time and more attention. And Jesus said, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Jesus knew the rubber band principle. You can push only so long before you have to pause. You can go, but eventually you have to slow. And so he said to his disciples, come with me to a private place and we'll get some rest. Like Jesus modeled this. Like, I know it's one of those unfathomable stories in the Bible, but in the midst of the storm, the disciples are scared, the waves are going crazy. Jesus is in the back of the boat, dozing off for a nap. Like, Jesus got it. Like, there are many times Jesus withdrew from the crowds physically so that he could be physically resilient. As true man, he understood that the human body could only stretch so far and go so far that it had limits. But that's not the only person... Jesus the Christ was. He was true man, but he's also 100% true God. That means that he was there at creation when on the seventh day, God rested. Jesus was a part of that. And then on Mount Sinai, when Moses received the Ten Commandments, Jesus, as God, was one of the ones delivering the message. Commandment number three, all of you memorized it, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Now, I'm guessing your pastors did a bang-up job of Reminding you of what the third commandment is all about, right? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Gather. Worship. Right? It's a worship commandment. It's so much more. Like if I as a pastor did you a disservice by not emphasizing this part of it, then shame on me. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do... You shall not do any work. You, nor your son or daughter, nor your male servants or female ones, your animals or any foreigner, nothing, nobody, no living thing in this community does a thing, lifts a finger, does any work, none, for a whole day, none. How many of you honor that on a weekly basis? Now, the Old Testament commandments don't necessarily apply in all their rules and ways, But I think there's a reason why Jesus, as true man, would say to his disciples, come with me and get some rest. As true man, he got it. As true God, there's a reason why God implemented that rule for a whole day, not just for worship, because you know what they didn't do that day? 
24 hours of on their knees praying, singing hymns like they worship, but it wasn't that all day long. It was rest. See, here's the principle that's in play when it comes to avoiding burnout so that you don't begin to, to compensate so that you don't ever compromise. Understand this biblical truth and principle. The creator, God himself, Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, the creator knows that the created has limits. How many of you can fly? Like some of the little kids here are going, yes, I could be Superman someday. Someday you'll grow up and figure it out. You can't. If any of you think you can, let's climb up the, to the roof and you jump off and let's see you go. None of you will do it. Why? Because you know you have limits. But you know what we do in almost every other area of our life that isn't quite like that? We push the limit. We work five extra hours a week. We take on the overtime. We add a second job. We push the limit. We get our kids in five activities as opposed to focusing on one activity. We push the limit. We do things with our time and schedule because we think the human body is indestructible. We push the limit to our detriment. And sometimes spiritually, in a sinful way, it's a lack of an acknowledgement that we are the created and sometimes we view ourselves as the creator and God. Like we get to make the rules. That's not the way it works. You're created. I mean, I want you to see that the creator, Jesus, knew his disciples had limits. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Old Testament knew that his people had limits. They needed to rest. They couldn't push and push and push without pausing. But I want you to see that and hold on to that in light of this as well as we consider today's principles. King David said, God, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Christians love this verse from, to show and teach that it, a life begins at conception. But I want you to see another part of it. I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God gave you your qualities, your strengths, your talents. God wants you to use them at work. Anyone who says, Pastor Tim talked about burnout, part of it must be work-related, I'm quitting my job. No, I didn't say that. That's a different sermon on laziness. God talks about that too. Like work and work hard and use your gifts, all good. But I want you to see right in here, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Like, God designed you fearfully and wonderfully. Like, sin has affected physical resiliency, but who you are, the body that you have, is fearfully and wonderfully made. God designed it with boundaries. God designed it and, and knows that there are limits. Like, it's an amazing thing, but there is an area, there is a window, there, there pretty much are, are rhythms that are a part of the physical resilience that are common to all of us. Like you can go somewhere between six and eight, and you might be different than I am or, or your neighbor is, but somewhere in there is the right place for sleep and rest to make the body really work. You're fearfully and wonderfully made to operate in getting a regular amount of sleep. Like your body loves to take in macros, like carbs, proteins, fats, all those things are all good in the right portions. Your body's designed fearfully and wonderfully in a good way to take in a certain amount of calories to help you function and operate each and every day. You start getting outside of the parameters one way on either side and you get to the danger zone, right? From a work standpoint, from a relational standpoint, you can only push so far, so long. Like, you have to know this, but you have to also celebrate God made you fearfully and wonderfully with those things in mind. And so with that in mind... I really want you to think and understand that the creator understands that the created has limits. That you're fearfully and wonderfully made and so we can talk about being physically resilient and in areas that God would tell us do not compromise and apply this to our life and maybe allow ourselves this year to be more resilient than ever and have the physical leg of the stool on the ground. Here are some of the biblical principles that, that I found that play into this area. Physical training is of some value. God says it's, it's good for you to have physical training. So some value. The Bible would say it. Doctors would say it. In vain you rise early and stay up late toiling for food. Like, in vain you, you burn it at both ends. 
But God grants sleep to those he loves. Like, God, God wants you to rest. And I know there are certain situations in life where these principles that we're going to talk about are going to be really hard because there are, there are things that happen in life that make some of these things really hard. Like, it's not a cure-all, a be-all, an end-all. Life is filled with sin. This is difficult and challenging. For some people, physical training is, is not possible because of physical limitations in the same way, the same about sleep. For some people, things are going on, legs of the stool are affected. Maybe here's the best principle. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, physically speaking, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So here's a truth. The created knows the created has limits. So biblical wisdom for the created starts with physical limits. Like if you look at your life right now and you know that you have compromised an area, your working uh, limit has been compromised, it might be time to put a physical limit. If you're overextended from other things in your schedule and, and a part of your life or you're not committing enough to some of the other things we're going to talk about, what do you need to eliminate in order to do these things so that you don't compromise, compensate, and crash? God doesn't want that for you. The Creator doesn't want that for you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. But all of us are, are created. Which is my takeaway. Like, if you want a takeaway, just to plug on your brain, when it comes to the physical leg of the stool, if the Creator understands the created has limits, if biblical wisdom begins with physical limits, then I need you to, to maybe take away this truth. Behave like a creationist. When we confess the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Don't just say the words. God would have you have a physical resiliency plan in your, at your disposal so that you can live it. I believe that God made me and all that I am, my body and all my members. He gave me eyes and ears, all these things. Like that's first article truth with first article explanation by Martin Luther. Behave like a creationist. You are created. The master of the universe, the creator of the universe, knows that you have limits. What guidelines would he have you consider and use your God-given brain that's fearfully and wonderfully made to listen to experts and apply it? To honor him with it. In all your godly callings. If you do these things, I believe this will be true in your life. In your godly callings as a friend, as a spouse, as a, a parent or a child, as an employer or an employee, as a friend in your group, like you will bless the relationships in your life if you will behave like a creationist. Like you're, 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 you will thrive more than merely survive. I guarantee it. God says it. You're fearfully, wonderfully made. And here's the machine gun approach to five things that it looks like to behave like a creationist. And my guess is these are areas of your life that most people are willing to compromise along the way for something else that they believe is important. Whether it's more money, early retirement, their kids, uh, someone else, like whatever it might be, behave like a creationist. Point number one, take your vacation time. Did you know that the United States, out of 200 nations, is second to last in how it offers vacation time? Like you live in the great United States of America, the land of the free, the home of the brave, everything good. You know, we have it all. But we are almost last on the list on holiday, paid time, and personal time off. So I need you to stop complaining about it it's just a reality. Talk to your boss about it. But I need you to take it. Sadly, so many people are willing to take the, the paycheck for the, their vacation hours and keep working because they want the money and they pay for it. This isn't just Pastor Tim. These are experts. Just listen to me for a second. A study was done of 12,000 middle-aged men who are, were at high risk for heart disease, not that yet. In the end, those who took more yearly vacations were less likely to die from any cause, any cause, including heart attacks and other cardiovascular problems. Take your vacation. Vacation reduces stress, boosts brain power, improves sleep. Studies reinforce it. There's a reason why I don't like staycations. I did one this last year, it will never happen again. It's not vacation. There's a reason why I go out of this country on vacation. It's not because I don't like you and don't want you to disturb me. Well, that's actually true. I do like you and I don't want you to disturb me. 
Because it's vacation. Take vacation. Second, get your Z's. Seems simple, self-explanatory. Your doctor will ask you. Every survey does it. About seven on average is what the um, average person needs. You can push, you can stretch. Like I've pulled all-nighters back in college, and you know what an all-nighter in college cost me? Two dayers. Like literally sleeping for two days straight. Like get your sleep. Like there are times when it, you have to push, you won't get as much, but it will catch up with you. And every expert would tell you from physical wellness, mental wellness, the health of your body, get your sleep. Third one's this. Take care of your temple. So many people set New Year's goals in this area. Can I just encourage you to take care of your temple? Like God fearfully and wonderfully made you. You know how many of these you get? One. A hundred years have come and gone. Work hours have gone down. We live about 35 more years than the person, average person did in 1920. Like we get this thing for a lot longer. Take care of your temple. 150 minutes of activity a week is what they say on average someone should have. Physical activity, some exercise. Strength training is good for your muscles and your bones. Like be physically active. So many people set goals in other areas when it comes to New Year's. Take care of your temple. Be physically active. Like it's important. But you know what you can't do? You can't out-exercise a bad diet. Take care of your temple. Like consider what you put in it. Eat good food. Like enjoy a lot of foods and enjoy cheat days and do whatever else you want to do. Like I'm not telling you you can't go through the drive through but take care of your temple. Eat well, exercise regularly, do what you can to take care of this amazing thing that's fearfully and wonderfully made by God. Point number four, regularly Sabbath. We're going to talk about spiritual next week, so I'm not talking about the gather route. I'm talking about rest. There was a time when I burned it on every end in ministry. My first few years of ministry, I wanted to be super pastor. I worked all day, came home, ate dinner, went out, knocked on doors for four hours every night for a six-month stretch. For the first two years, I probably burned it, about 65 hours a week. I was being faithful in that godly calling. But you know what it cost me? A whole lot in the relational area with my wife. Like Sunday morning was over, I was burned out, I was exhausted and tired, I just wanted to take a nap, and I got home and she met me at the door with the keys in her hand and said, these are yours, those two youngsters that are now grown up, bye. And she wasn't leaving me, she was just going shopping and wanted nothing to do with the house. I don't do that anymore. Like, I'll work really hard. All of our pastors are faithful, but I encourage all of them to take a day. Like, enjoy a day. Like, you might have a hobby on that day. This is not a day to to run around town and do all sorts of things that are still going to exhaust you. Like, slow down, stop and pause, rest. Physically. Last one. Here it is. I'm going to fill in the screen. Set boundaries for balance. Like you need to maybe work at, look at your work life right now and you need to set a new boundary. There needs to be a ceiling that's only acceptable because right now you are compromising, like working out, being physically active, being whatever it might be because you are pushing hard because you want to make more money. It might be because your boss is making you. That doesn't mean you don't have a choice. Like we're going to talk about it next week, but you know the average American house size has increased 50% in the last 20 years. Because we need more space? Families are smaller. Because we can. Sometimes it, because we don't have a boundary on how much we think we need to make because we want. Set some boundaries for balance in your physical life. What does it look like? What's the ceiling? What's the basement floor? in all those different areas. And as you consider all that, remember this last verse. Like, to behave like a creationist celebrates this, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Like, God lives in you. Like, you were bought at a price. The Lord redeemed you, body and soul. Praise the Lord. Like, if you're looking for motivation, look no further than the cross of Jesus and the empty tomb of Jesus the one who knew rest was important, who designed it for God's people so that you could have eternal rest. He bought you, bought you. He redeemed you body and soul. 
which empowers us to honor God. So which one on the list do you want to work at? What do you need to eliminate from your current list so that you can do it, so you don't end up burned out? Physical resilience, leg of the stool. May God bless us as we continue on for the rest of the series. Let's call on him to do that with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, there are people here right now who are probably burned out. Like the holidays were not restful and did not allow them to refill. And the truth is, Lord, life is hard. And all these different areas are things we want to work on. And they begin with the things, Lord, that we're willing to compromise. And we just saw a list, Lord, of things that we can't. So help us set mar margins for balance. We need boundaries because we are the created and you are the creator. You acknowledged that and recognized that for your people long ago. It still applies to us. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. So let us, Lord, look at how we can honor you with the bodies that you redeemed.